Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all parties will be in a listen-only mode. I'd like to inform all parties that today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the conference over to Lacey Lofton. Thank you. You may begin. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for our Census Academy webinar. Um, before we introduce our speaker, I just want to touch on two quick housekeeping items. Um, first of all, uh, this is a really cool presentation. I know many of you will have questions while we're going through it. If you do, uh, please send any of your questions to all panelists in the chat feature. Um, we will be keeping an eye on those, and at the end of the presentation, we'll ask any questions that came up um, during. If for some reason we don't get to your question um, that you did send us in chat, don't worry. We will follow up with an email after the presentation, so um, we will keep track of those for you. Also, at the very end, we will send out a survey. Um, it'll be in the chat as well. Um, you click on the link, and it'll take you to an external site, but we'd love for you to take a few minutes to fill out that survey about uh, the presentation and if there's anything we could do in the future to better meet your needs or if there's more you'd like to hear about that we could expand the topic, that would be awesome too. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Chris Martin. Uh, Chris is a historian with the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, and he is responsible for the history of the American Community Survey, the history of the 2020 Census, and the Alumni Biography Program. Uh, he's previously worked with the Docu Documents Compass at the University of Virginia. Um, he worked on People of the Founding Era Digital Database. He's also worked on Mount Vernon's Enslaved, uh, the database of Mount Vernon's enslaved community at George Washington's Mount Vernon, and as an interpreter at the James Madison's Montpelier. Uh, Chris now lives near Census Bureau headquarters in the Washington, D.C. area with his wife, his son, and his two dogs. Uh, and with that, I will turn this over to you, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Lacey. As the country has expanded and as the census has expanded with it, the Census Bureau has both tried to count and include all Americans throughout our history. The census has been part of the United States since the ratification of the Constitution in 1789. It is one of the foundations of the United States government which depends on the census to allocate voting power and resources evenly based on population. Several changes have been made since 1789. The 1929 Reapportionment Act set the limit of the House of Representatives at 435, which eliminated the population totals required for each House seat and introduced the Huntington Hill apportionment method. The three-fifths clause for all other persons, meaning enslaved persons, was overturned by the 14th Amendment, and Indians not taxed would be eliminated by a decision of the Attorney General just prior to the 1940 census. As the AG decided, supported by President Roosevelt, that at this point, all American Indians and Alaska Natives in some way fell under U.S. jurisdiction. The first census takers were U.S. Marshals, who were the only federal agents in the states. The categories for the first census were free white males over 16, free white males under 16, white females, all other free people, and enslaved persons. The Marshals had varied backgrounds, but almost all were Revolutionary War veterans with links to George Washington. The country soon started expanding into former Spanish and French territories. The Louisiana Purchase was in 1803. It was purchased from France, but it also included previously Spanish territory. The Florida Session in 1819 was between Spain and the United States, and it led to the statehood of Florida in 1845. And the Texas Annexation in 1845 helped start the Mexican-American War from 1846 to 1849, which led to the Mexican Cession of 1848 and the Gadsden Purchase in 1853. As part of these expansions, the census began employing Hispanic census takers in the former Spanish territories. Jose Simeon Sanchez is the first identifiable Hispanic census taker as Marshal of East Florida from 1837 to 1841. He had an American mother and changed his name to Joseph when the U.S. government took over from the Spanish. He served as a sheriff and a lieutenant in the Florida Rangers and signed the first Florida Constitution in 1838. Fernando Joaquin Moreno was born on February 5, 1824, in Pensacola, Florida, and moved to Key West to run a mercantile business and serve as consul for several nations. In March of 1853, the U.S. Senate confirmed his nomination as a United States Marshal, a position he would hold until 1861. 
As marshal, one of Fernando's many responsibilities included the taking of the census. The 1860 census not only counted population, but also surveyed mines, agriculture, commerce, manufacturers, education, and other topics. Fernando enumerated the entirety of Monroe County, Florida himself, which had a population of 2,913 people in 1860. However, Fernando did not count approximately 1,432 people in Monroe County that June. They were African men and women who were waiting at Key West to learn their fate after being rescued by the United States Navy from three different slave ships intended for Cuba. Although slavery was still legal in the American South, by 1860, the United States and almost every European nation had outlawed the trade in humans between Africa and the Americas. Whenever U.S. Navy ships encountered illegal slavers, they confiscated the ship and took the human cargo to the nearest port, where they became the responsibility of the local government official. As Marshal of Key West, the nearest port to the smuggling routes of Cuba, responsibility for these people fell to Fernando, who quickly set about organizing the building of shelters and a hospital. Fernando spent thousands of dollars of his own money, money which for the rest of his life he would unsuccessfully petition the United States for reimbursement. Due to his hard work, the majority of the remaining Africans avoided sickness, and by July 19th, they were all en route back to Africa. In the West, Pedro Valdez served as marshal for the 1860 census of New Mexico. Pedro was born in 1825 in Taos, New Mexico, and his father was descended from some of the first Spaniards to come to New Mexico in the 17th century. When the U.S. military occupied New Mexico in 1847 during the Mexican-American War, Pedro learned English and performed the duties of sheriff and justice of the peace in his hometown of Taos, in addition to running a mercantile business. In 1860, he received an appointment as assistant marshal for Taos and Mora counties. Between the two counties, Pedro counted a total population of 19,669 people. Pedro represented exactly what the census office wanted from its census takers. Not only did the people in his territory trust him, as evidenced by his election to several political positions, but he also had a deep knowledge of the area through his travels as a merchant. In 1880, the Census Bureau replaced U.S. Marshals with specially trained temporary enumerators, and once again, Pedro worked as a census taker, this time in Sapello and the surrounding areas. However, due to the increase in the number of enumerators and possibly in deference to his advanced age and responsibilities, his area was much smaller, and Pedro only enumerated 822 people in 1880. The Civil War not only shaped how the U.S. approached the census, but the census itself played a role in how the war was planned and fought. Seen here is the first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation of President Lincoln by Francis Bicknell Carpenter. It's currently in display in the U.S. Capitol, and it took the artist six months of a White House residency to complete uh, while Lincoln was still there. The map shown at the bottom right corner of the painting is a map made by the U.S. Coast Survey in 1861 by using census data from 1860. It shows the relative distribution of slavery in southern counties that year. Joseph C.G. Kennedy director of both the 1850 and the 1860 censuses, is seen here third from right with President Lincoln after the Battle of Antietam. Anticipating the possibility of war, Kennedy abbreviated the census publication plans, and when hostilities broke out, Kennedy ordered his statisticians and cartographers to create detailed maps of the southern states. Maps like the distribution of slaves in 1860 provided vital information about the South's population, agriculture, and transportation networks. Another Census Bureau director, Francis Hamasa Walker, took part in the Battle of Antietam as a major with the 15th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment and would later lead the Census Bureau through some of its biggest advancements in the censuses of 87, 1870 and 1880. His replacement, Charles Seaton, also served as an officer in the Civil War with the 1st Vermont Sharpshooters. In 1879, Seaton was appointed chief clerk of the 10th Census under Francis Hamasa Walker. When Walker resigned in 1881, Seaton succeeded him as superintendent of the census until it was complete. Seaton invented several machines, including one to tally census results that was first used by the office in 1872 for the 1870 census, and then again in 1880 before it was replaced by Herman Hollerith's electronic tabulation machine in 1890. With the end of slavery brought about by the Civil War, 1870 was the first year where African Americans served as census marshals. One of these marshals was George Washington Francis. 
He was born in 1820 in the state of New York. In 1850, he lived in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where he worked as a barber and lived with his wife, Charity, and their two sons, George and Thomas. In 1859, after his wife's death, George married Catherine Beach, a white woman, a white woman and the widow of one of his friends. When Catherine's friends found out about the marriage several months later, they had her committed to an insane asylum until George could secure her freedom and move them to New York City. In 1870, he had, George had not only found business success, but he had become involved with politics. In May of 1870, he represented his district of New York City at the state Republican convention. Businessman, showman, and Connecticut politician P.T. Barnum provided a reference letter for George in February of 1870 that may have been used to help procure his first government patronage job, that of census marshal and census clerk for the 1870 census. Following the conclusion of the 1870 decennial operations, George's performance and connections earned him a job at the U.S. Customs House, where he worked with men such as Herman Melville and Chester A. Arthur. He also continued his work with the Republican Party to improve the lives of his fellow African Americans. There were many other men from this time who showed that census work was considered a noble and respected position, particularly as a clerk at headquarters. John H. Smith is the first black man to attend the Philadelphia Academy of Fine Arts. He served as a census clerk for the 1870 census while attending Howard Law School. For the first time, Superintendent Walker hired census clerks through tests rather than patronage. After the census, uh, John H. Smith worked as a lawyer, a banker, and from 1878 to 1885 as U.S. Ambassador to Liberia. Next is John Willis Menard, a newspaperman, businessman, and politician from Illinois with deep roots in New Orleans. After the 1868 death of Congressman James Mann of Louisiana's 2nd District, John Willis Menard ran as the Republican in the ensuing special election. Despite John winning a clear majority, his opponent challenged the results all the way to the U.S. House of Representatives. On February 27, 1869, John became the first African American to speak before the entire House in support of claiming his seat. Despite his appeal, the House remained deadlocked and the seat went unfilled until the next general election. By 1880, John and his family had relocated to Washington, D.C., where he worked as a clerk at the Treasury Department. In September 1889, he earned an appointment to work on the 1890 census, where he worked until his death in 1893. Lastly, perhaps one of the most influential black thinkers, writers, and activists of the early 20th century, W.E.B. Du Bois used his gifts as a social scientist and writer to fight for equal rights for black Americans throughout his life. In 1904, for part of the Census Bulletin No. 8, Du Bois wrote an analysis of black farmers in the southern United States. His analysis used statistics to counter the racist narrative of the day and showed how black farmers used their land and agricultural skills to make a better life for themselves and their families. As black women followed black men into new jobs and opportunities, several outstand outstanding women served as some of the first black female field employees of the Census Bureau. Gertrude Rush was born in 1880 in Texas and eventually settled in Des Moines, Iowa. In early 1910, she passed the enumerator examination and became one of the 1,605 African-American enumerators working nationwide. Following her census work, Gertrude continued her education, and in 1918, she became the first black woman to pass the Iowa State Bar, an accomplishment not repeated until 1950. In 1925, after being denied admission to the American Bar Association, she and four male lawyers founded the Negro Bar Association, now called the National Bar Association. In 1985, the National Bar Association now established the Gertrude E. Rush Award, which honors lawyers and judges based on their leadership in the community and who have demonstrated a concern for human and civil rights and are models for excellence in legal education, along with perseverance in the law, public policy, and social activism. Bertha M. M. White also served as an enumerator in 1910. She was a founding member of the National Negro Business League, along with Booker T. Washington, and leveraged her business success to become a major philanthropist in the Jacksonville area, with several of her projects still providing for the disadvantaged today. Although Eartha targeted her projects towards the poor black population, which was underserved in the segregated South, her charities supported people of all races. During the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918, one-third of the people fed by her soup kitchen were white. Around the same time as black men and women joined the census workforce, so too did American Indians and Alaska Natives. 
For the seventh census of the United States, conducted in 1850, the superintendent of the census asked the Commissioner of Indian Affairs to provide account of the various tribes and populations under his supervision. A provision for counting Indians in the race color category first appeared in the census of 1860 for Indians who had renounced tribal affiliation and lived with settler communities or in large eastern cities. In 1890, the Census Bureau made an effort to count all Indians, both taxed and untaxed, and the results were published in extensive monographs focused on the population, culture, and customs of several tribes of the continental U.S. and Alaska. In Alaska, following 1880, when only a straight population count was taken and continuing throughout the period during which Alaska remained a territory, the Census Bureau utilized special schedules that allotted room for tribal information specific to Native Alaskans. With the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924 and subsequent legislation, the established status of American Indians meant that they would be fully counted on the regular population schedules starting in 1940. Captain Dave Numana was one of the first American Indian census takers for the 1880 census. He was born in western Nevada around 1829. His father was Paiute and his mother was Shoshone. In 1879, the Paiute tribe elected Captain Dave as chief, and for this, his tribe would bestow, him, uh, bestow upon him the title of Numana, which means father. In 1880, Superintendent Walker turned to tribal leaders to assist with the count of American Indians, and Captain Dave supervised the enumeration of the Paiute tribes in Nevada. Working in an environment that lacked traditional literacy, Captain Dave improvised for the census by having his enumerators draw pictograms of each home in each village. He would then transfer this information to notched sticks, which he bundled by village and sent to the census office for tallying. In this way, they counted 3,171 people in his tribe. To honor his many contributions, when the Paiute tribe started a hatchery in 1988 to help recover the endangered fish of Lake Pyramid, they named it, as well as a dam on the Truckee Truckee River, after Captain Dave. The 1890 census, which published Captain Dave's 1880 work, provided photographs, reports, and statistics on many tribes, including in Alaska, that had never been documented before. These reports included information on social customs, dress, economy, and housing situation, and included biographies and portraits of influential American Indians. Some of these tribes have since disappeared or been absorbed into larger groups, making the 1890 report on Indians taxed and Indians not taxed in the United States valuable as one of the few records remaining for these people and their descendants. In Alaska, 1880 was the first decennial census. Both the 1880 and 1890 reports on Alaska contained valuable anthropological and ethnographic information similar to that of the 1890 report on Indians. By 1900, like discoveries about enumeration in other areas, officials found locals, specifically teachers, served as the best enumerators in hard-to-count areas. They became so entrenched as census takers that, in 1920, the superintendent of education led the census in Alaska. One of these teachers was Catherine Diakonoff Seller, an Aleut Indian who was born on December 7, 1884, on the Aleutian Island of Luna, Alaska. A longtime educator whose career started in 1910, Catherine and her husband served as census taker and translator for the 1920 census on Kodiak Island. In 1940, Catherine once again received the assignment to enumerate parts of Kodiak Island. And from previous experience, the U.S. Census Bureau realized that the distances and difficulties of enumerating Alaska's sparse population required significantly more time. Census officials allocated a year for the completion of census schedules, so despite Census Day falling on April 1, 1940, the Census of Alaska commenced on October 1, 1939. In 1950, the U.S. Department of Interior recognized Catherine's life of public service, and Congress awarded Catherine a medal. In 2017, Alaska honored her with induction into the Alaska Woman's Hall of Fame. In addition to Alaska, American expansions around this time led to new territories in the Pacific and Caribbean. In order to better govern these new territories, one of the first administrative tasks conducted by the U.S. was almost always a census. After Hawaii became a U.S. territory in 1898, the Census Bureau first enumerated the islands during the 1900 census. However, communication difficulties at this time, 56.6% of the population of Hawaii over the age of 10 did not speak English, exacerbated by a plague outbreak, had significantly delayed the counting. To this end, a group of locals who represent the many languages spoken on Hawaii assembled under Dr. Victor Clark, the special agent in charge of the 1910 census. 
The group created lessons in various languages to disseminate at schools and other public areas in order to familiarize the people with the population, agriculture, and manufacturing schedules. David Kalnohia Kalabre served as the translator and outreach specialist for Native Hawaiians in the 1910 census. Two of David's early mentors were Kumua Oo, a son of King Kamehameha the Great, and his son, William H. Kaniho, who taught David the ways of the Kahuna. In 1919, David and his family started a hula, hula troupe with a goal of reviving the traditional dance that had almost died out under the disapproving influence of 19th century missionaries. David and his wife also taught classes on Hawaiian culture, legends, language, and songs to locals and began using these to entertain visitors. Now considered one of the premier kahunas on Hawaiian culture, David eventually wrote a book, The Kahuna Religion of Hawaii. In 1917, after overtures dating back to 1867, the United States purchased the Virgin Islands from Denmark. One of the first tasks undertaken by the United States was a census. Based on past experiences, the Census Bureau knew that the quickest way to get competent, trustworthy, and knowledgeable workers was to hire local teachers. Ivana Eudora Keen was a lifelong educator and one of the teachers who started the enumeration of St. Thomas on December 24, 1917, during the holiday break. In addition to being the first U.S. Census of the Virgin Islands, the 1917 Census also tested new technology and census-taking methods by equipping the enumerators in the field with hole punch machines in an effort to save time transferring data from written schedules to punch cards back at headquarters. Eudora and her fellow teachers conducted the census of Charlotte Amalie with work ending after three weeks on January 12, 1918. However, the experimental method of hole-punching census cards in the field proved too cumbersome and inefficient. In fact, the Census Bureau would not test another handheld census-taking device for field workers until almost a century after Eudora's efforts. Similar to Puerto Rico, Cuba first fell under U.S. control after the Spanish-American War in 1898, with the first census conducted in 1899. One of these census takers was Amelia de Cordobo y Rubio, who was born on November 28, 1853, in Mayabec Province, Cuba. After the Spanish-American War, Amelia petitioned the American military governor to open government employment in Cuba to women. Not only did the governor immediately implement the suggestion, but Amelia received the first appointment as a clerk in the Cuban government, where she worked in the Department of Public Works. To impart to her influence, 142 women worked as enumerators during the 1899 census. Amelia herself enumerated a district in Havana. For the 1907 census of Cuba, Amelia once again served as an enumerator, covering several districts in Havana. Not only did she open the doors to government employment for women, but she earned a reputation as someone who would look out for the rights of veterans, refugees, and former slaves. She is also considered the first woman Mambisa, or independence fighter, of Cuba. In 1928, the city of Havana dedicated a statue to Amelia in her old neighborhood and renamed the park in which it still sits, Cordoba Park. Like Amelia's groundbreaking work to include women in the government roles in Cuba, the suffragists of the United States has blazed, had blazed their trail several decades earlier. In 1880, the first year to use enumerators instead of marshals, and the first to include women census takers, there were around 200 female enumerators out of 31,382. In 1890, this increased to 800 out of 46,804, and by 1909, 10 years before the 19th Amendment granted national women suffrage, over 15 over 50% of the Census Bureau's 624 permanent employees were women. In 1919, the first five female supervisors were appointed, and in 1920, five out of 372 field supervisors were women for the first time. One of the first class of woman enumerators in 1880 was Stella Goslin Stella Cohen, and if you can tell from some of her quotes there, she was involved in the women's suffrage movement. Another woman from the first class of female enumerators in 1880 was Dr. Jenny V.H. Baker, who served as census a census enumerator while attending medical school. Women also began increasingly being employed at headquarters in Washington, D.C. Nanny Lancaster, a writer from Washington, worked as a copyist and tabulator on the decennial census in 1880 and as a tabulator for the 1890 census. The 1890 census revolutionized census taking through the use, use of Herman Hollerith's tabulation machine, which greatly reduced the amount of time needed for compiling raw census data. 
Some women were hugely influential within the Census Bureau. Mary Orsler began working for the Census Office in 1900 and eventually became the official custodian of records. From here, Mary would maintain the original census returns for the entirety of the United States for over 30 years. In this position, she safeguarded what she believed was the greatest human document in the country. Part of this responsibility revolved around the census's commitment to privacy. In 1930, the Census Bureau's standard for releasing individual census information to the public was 50 to 60 years. In 1952, an agreement between the National Archives and Records Administration and the Census Bureau extended the wait to 72 years with NARA responsible for the release. They will be responsible for the release of the 1950 census next year in 2022. The first female chief of division was Emily Ida Farnham, who served in the Census Bureau for 40 years and who was the first expert chief of division in July 1919 as chief of the appointments division. She was also very active in the suffragist movement in Washington, D.C. Although much of the legislation is recent regarding the protections and accommodations for employing those with disabilities, the Census Bureau has long focused on employing people in this group. Francis Amasa Walker, due to his Civil War service, greatly advocated hiring union veterans and specifically disabled veterans. Daniel E. Taylor was one of those disabled veterans. In 1863, outside of Pattersonville, Louisiana, a Confederate round struck his right arm as he took water to a wounded comrade. Surgeons later amputated his arm, and he received his discharge from the Army. In 1870, Daniel received an appointment as Assistant U.S. Marshal for the taking of the ninth decennial census, where he enumerated 3,972 people in Granby, in addition to the local agriculture, manufacturing, and industry. Some people may recognize Alexander Graham Bell. As early as 1889, Bell had made recommendations to the superintendent of the census office for proper enumeration of the deaf and blind in the census. He emphasized the need for properly phrased questions in order to discern true levels of disability and the acquisition of these disabilities. On October 10, 1900, the census director appointed him expert special agent of the census office for the preparation of the report on the deaf and the blind, and the report was the most comprehensive in census history. In particular, enumerators differentiated those with hearing, speaking, or sight impairment from those with mental or physical disabilities. Another effort Bell worked towards was the hiring of more deaf people at the Census Bureau, one of whom was Roy James Stewart. In 1900, Roy began working at the Census Office following graduation from Gallaudet University. At first, he worked in the tabulation department, where his deafness actually helped him avoid the intense and aggravating sounds the machines caused. Bell, who also had ties to Gallaudet, quickly re recruited Goy Roy to his team. The legacy left behind by Bell and Roy continued well past their departures. Throughout the 20th century, as the country became more diverse, so too did the Census Bureau. Immigrants to the continental United States, like the Chinese in the 19th century, came to be included. Born in Guangdong Province in China, Walter Fong was the first Chinese graduate of Stanford University. He served as special agent for the enumeration of Chinese people in San Francisco in 1900. Out of the 307 enumerators required for San Francisco, Walter supervised 10, with a Chinese interpreter accompanying each enumerator. Walter's enumerators counted the vast majority of San Francisco's 13,954 Chinese residents. This group of late 19th century and early 20th century immig immigrants also included European immigrants as well as refugees. Edith Basetch was born in Vienna, Austria, and lived through Kristallnacht or the Night of Broken Glass on November 10, 1938. On August 26, 1939, her family boarded a train from Vienna to Paris just a week before the Germans invaded Poland and continued from Paris to the United States, United States excuse me, arriving in New York on September 16, 1939. After marrying, Edith settled in Allentown, Pennsylvania in 1959, where she raised three children. In addition to her volunteer work, which included serving on the local parent-teacher association, Edith helped her community through her work as a census taker. The area around Allentown contained some of the highest concentrations of German immigrants in the United States, so much so that they were known as the Pennsylvania Dutch, Dutch being a derivative of Deutsch, which is German for German. Edith's comfort with the customs and language of her neighbors helped as she gathered information for the various surveys she worked on. 
Finally, following the Stonewall Uprising in 1969, the U.S. Census Bureau first actively recruited from the LGBTQ plus community in 1980. This included enumerator Bill Camillo. Following high school, Bill went to Rutgers University, where he was active in the gay and lesbian rights movement, most notably through his work with the Rutgers Gay Alliance. The 1980 census was the first to offer the option partner or roommate to classify the relationship of unmarried couples, both gay and straight. Prior to that, the head of household had to list the other as lodger or, bo or boarder. Additionally, this was the first time the Census Bureau actively pursued gay and lesbian enumerators, and Bill successfully passed the enumerators testing and training early in 1980. In the 1980s, Bill raised millions of dollars through events to support research and victims of the AIDS crisis. In recognition of his work, when Bill passed away in 1993, the Board of Supervisors of San, San Francisco closed their meeting that day with a moment of silence. Thank you all for coming and listening to our webinar. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, please visit www.census.gov slash history. Uh, from there, if you navigate to our Census Then and Now and our notable alumni site, you'll find biographies about several of the people I've listed today, including many more. Uh, if you would like more current census data, please visit data.census.gov. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, my phone number and email address are listed at the bottom of the slide there. Uh, once again, thank you, and I'll hand this back over to Lacey. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, great presentation. We have a lot of really detailed questions here. Um, so if you guys sent a, if you sent a very specific question in the chat, we will get back to you uh, via email. Uh, but Chris, there were a couple that were more broad. Um, one that came up in different forms was basically how do you choose your projects in the history department, and and how did you originally start looking at some of these individuals? Um, thank you. Uh, we, we go about it in different, different ways. Um, sometimes we're specifically looking to research a, a group and uh, we look for the most uh, standout people within that group. Other times we're researching something completely different and we come across somebody who stands out in the historical record. Um, so really it's a, it's a variety of ways, whether we're looking for them or whether they pop out of the historical record, uh, just um, their contributions uh, as part of the Census Bureau as well as their contributions uh, and, and, you know, in their larger community are what we look at when we're choosing people. Excellent. Um, actually, there was another question that I think you just covered in that answer as well. Um, so I think I will wrap up at this point. Thank you again so much, Chris. This was a great presentation. Um, for everybody who's listening, we are going to send out a survey in the chat here. Um, if you can please click on that and provide us your feedback. We do take that seriously. Um, at this point, we will wrap up. And thank you so much for joining us today. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time.